Hello, and welcome to The Backstory on Public Access Television and Longmont Public Media in Longmont. My name is Tim Waters. I'm the host of The Backstory, and uh, I have the good fortune in this program of the opportunity to interview the three principal leaders and founders of Longmont Public Media, which is Longmont's new public access television service provider. Scott Converse, uh, Macy May, and Sergio Angelis are co-founders of Longmont Public Media. Scott is the chief executive officer, Macy is the chief operating officer, and Sergio is the chief technology officer. So this has been a, uh, an interesting transition uh, for you and for the city of Longmont, and I wanna jump right in to uh, who, who you are, what you're doing, and why this is so important to both the city government and the residents of Longmont. So one thing I've said in all of the introductions to the, to the backstories is that every story in Longmont that gets reported somewhere is interesting. More interesting than what you read about in the newspaper typically is what you don't read. It's the backstory. And the backstory on this project is fascinating and important to every member of this community. So to get started, it uh, would be good to learn a little bit about you three, because I know you've done a lot of work together, not just in LPM. But I'll, I'll maybe I'll first, Scott, defer to you. Tell us a little bit about who you are, your background, and, and the work you three have been doing leading up to Longmont Public Media, and then we'll do around the horn to, to Macy and Sergio. All right. Um, well, I've spent uh, several decades, actually, in corporate America, uh, companies like Apple Computer and Paramount Pictures and MCI and Motorola. And um, about probably about 20 years ago, I got interested in startup companies. I got tired of doing stuff with big companies and started doing startups like uh, we did one called Clickcaster, which was one of the first podcasting companies in the world. And then uh, Medio, which is one of the first over the top smart TV apps companies. So we created apps for Samsung and Sony and TVs like that. And um, did that for a while. And then about um, seven or eight years ago, I moved back home, back to Longmont, where I grew up, which is why I'm here now, and um, started a thing called Tinker Mill, which is a media, or which is a maker space, um, and got that going, which now is, uh, I think, the second largest uh, maker space in the country. It's got six or 700 members. Uh, it's a huge facility full of tools. And, knowledge and amazing people that teach each other stuff and around this around three years ago um, the times call moved out of Longmont and it shut down its building and it took all of its personnel out and it kind of PO'd me I just thought you know we need we need local media and Sergio and I found each other through mutual friends and we started Longmont um, Observer and about a month was it a month or so Macy maybe a month and a half later, Macy joined us uh, and uh, quickly became our editor in chief. It became clear she knew what she was talking about. When we <laughs> and, and so um, the three of us really got the Longmont Observer going and that is still going strong. Uh, matter of fact, we've had some of the largest uh, readership of that uh, in its history. We had uh, what, 12,000 people on one day, just a few days ago, wow. certainly something like that. So um, it right now during this crisis, which is by the way, everyone, why we're all separately on these different screens, uh, we're using uh, video conferencing technology to make this possible, making this show possible. So about um, a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, uh, it became apparent that uh, the, the cable TV guys um, were not really keeping up with the times. And I had written a presentation to the city council which was, hey, you guys, we could do this. We could do this um, and spend a lot less money, get a lot more stuff. And why doesn't the cable trust look at doing that? And so the city council put me on the cable trust board. <laughs> so that's kind of what happened. And I gave this same presentation to the cable trust and they were like, nah, just sit down and be quiet. Um, we're fine where we're at. And at around that time, city council decided, you know, maybe we should be looking at this. The uh, Cable Trust guys had been running the public access TV station since about 19, I believe, 84. So about 37-ish years they've been running this, um, this public uh, media entity. 
and had never been put out to bid, had never had any competition or any question of what they were doing. So the city decided, and uh, Tim, you were, I believe, were part of this, Marshall Martin, uh, six, I believe six out of the seven council members voted to do an RFP, do a request for proposal for Lomont's um, cable access and public access channel. And we and three other entities, the Cable Trust itself, um, Longmont Observer, uh, the, uh, I believe uh, the company was called Vive and then another company, all, all bid on it. And surprisingly, we won that bid. And so January 1st, the Longmont Observer uh, has kind of taken a bit of a back seat. They are separate entities. Longmont Public Media is set up as a doing business as part of Longmont Observer, but that's a temporary thing until we can separate them completely, which will probably happen the end of this year. And that's sort of how it all came about. We are, we're currently still doing both, um, but it really is operating as two separate operations. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to some aspects of what you just said. Having, I might, I might put my city council hat on just for a few minutes as we reflect on some of that. Uh, I'll, do that I'll do that later. Macy, tell us about you. Tell us your background and how did you get connected with these two fellas and, and what draws you to this work? Well, like Scott said, it was about, uh, the Observer started in about March of 2017 and in June I met up with uh, Sergio through a friend of mine who had been reading the Observer for a few months and um, he had noticed they were looking for editors and at that point I was trying to transition from just being a full-time mom to getting back into the workforce and what I wanted to do was edit and I had um, needed some extra experience in the in the workforce uh, just because 10 years off is kind of a long time and um, so Scott and Sergio gave me a shot and we've been working together I, I don't know I'd say pretty well since then it's been four years now and uh, it's just an, it's been a lot of fun and I've enjoyed you know just the connections that we've made I had moved to Longmont in 2014 from um, a pretty small town in Oklahoma where everybody kind of knows your name and um, you know Longmont seems pretty big for something like that and and so I wasn't connected to my community and through the observer through LPM I've I've really been able to connect and call this home so that's that's my draw to that and I've learned so much as far as the media side is concerned Scott and Sergio have been wonderful mentors and teachers for that um, but it, it's been great in expanding my editing capabilities. So that's kind of where we got tied in together. Well, I'd say uh, you've done a pretty good job of connecting both with the city and with the people in the city. Yes. Uh, based on my observations. Sergio, I think of you as uh, this multi-talented uh, entrepreneur, bright light in town. Tell us about you and not just what you're doing here, but I know you're doing a number of interesting things in Longmont in sure. service to the community, business community and others. Sure. Yeah. So I graduated from the University of Richmond in 2013. Um, so I've only been out of college for seven years. Um, but right after I joined an IT consulting company um, and did back end application work for Bank of America. And then from there, I transitioned to designing and building iOS apps for Navy Federal Credit Union and then moved on to Marriott and helped them um, add more features, specifically on the Android team. Um, and then in 2016, I moved back to Longmont, um, which is where my parents currently live, um, to pursue some startup projects of my own. Um, and then, then at the end of that year, 2016 was when I ended up meeting Scott Converse uh, through a mutual friend. Um, and given the um, media climate at the time, uh, nationally and locally, um, we decided to launch the Observer in 2017. Um, and then in late 2018, I joined the Longmont Economic Development Partnership, um, doing um, entrepreneurial and innovation work, uh, economic development work uh, for the city, um, talking with business owners and entrepreneurs, figuring out what, you know, what's the status of our ecosystem, what do we need, what's missing, um, how can we improve upon it, um, and out of that, um, led Innovate Longmont, which is a startup accelerator program, um, which has since spun off into its own entity. Um, so I've been working on that and then obviously Longmont Public Media as well. Well, I would say anybody who, any of the listeners or the viewers of this program 
have read the book by Katz on the new, li new localism, mm -hmm. uh, you three and the things you've been involved with epitomize uh, what is the state of play, right, for emerging uh, uh, on the edge, vibrant communities. So good on you for um, you know, taking the lead in so many areas. It would help, I think, uh, before we get into the specifics of what you're doing, for folks to learn a little bit more about public access television. What does that mean? How does it get funded? Where did it come from? Uh, why does the city contract with anybody to provide quote unquote public access television services? Who wants to take that? Uh, I can dive into that a little bit. Yeah. Um, it really started when cable television started creating um, monopolies in cities for their services, uh, where cities would effectively sign a contract um, with a specific cable television provider. And part of that deal was they would get a franchise fee, generally about 5% of whatever the bill was. Um, and uh, several um, national laws were passed to ensure that the, the fees themselves that the cities were collecting were used also for the public good. And as a result, public access television was created, which was effectively saying on these cable channels, you have to set aside a certain amount of resources, um, space, equipment, channels on the cable networks themselves. And you have to enable uh, three types of programming, public access, which is allowing it so anybody can create a TV show for the local community, educational uh, information um, could be about anything, could be schools themselves, but it could just be general educational information. And then governmental, which was really creating transparency of government, things like what you what, what you do now, which is the city council has their meeting every week and that's broadcast on public access TV. So now our, we do 17 boards and commissions um, that we record and broadcast. We also transcribe all those meetings so that there is a full text a transcription uh, using software to do the transcriptions available to each of those meetings. So that's kind of where it all started. And over time, what's happened is that funding uh, really got to be fairly large. It was several million dollars a year that was available for that kind of stuff. And public access was a, generally a separate entity in every city in America that had a cable system, which eventually became every city. Um, and what happened was that the money itself, there was a loophole in the money, that franchise fee. You, the cities weren't required to give the full amount to the public access operations. So what started happening was the city started taking part of that money. Um, originally it was 10%, then it was you know 25 and then 50, and currently in Longmont, for instance, it's 75% of the money that's collected for franchise fees is kept and used in other things like public safety and for whatever else the city wants to spend it on. And that was fine because it was still generally enough money because the dollars had gotten fairly high, but about, and we helped cause this, when we did things like Medio and Clickcaster, when the internet came around, you started to see a drop off happening with um, people paying for cable. And if you don't pay for cable, you don't pay the franchise fee. So those fees started to drop. So um, what's been happening over the last 10 years and really accelerated over the last three or four is that there's a thing called cord cutting where people just don't have cable anymore. Uh, and as a result, um, we're seeing those fees drop substantially and the money to run public access television is dropping very quickly. Um, like uh, this, this, year, this year in 2020, uh, it's around $150,000. Last year it was around $170,000. The year before it was in 190 range. The year before that it was in 220 range. So it's, you're seeing this definite downward spiral. And as people continue to use the internet more and pay for cable TV less, you're going to see that eventually go down to zero. So what we decided was that it probably made sense to try some new models. That's why we talked a little bit about Tinker Mill earlier. That's a maker space where people, the community gets together, shares resources and tools and knowledge uh, and um, keeps the, keeps um, uh, a, a large space, it's kind of a 21st century uh, university um, going. And I thought that model might work here. Let's see if we can create a media maker space. And that's what, that's what, where we got to today. We still have that money coming from the city, but it's gonna be doing this over the next two, three years. And I figure three to four years from now, there will be literally no money there. So we had to find a way to replace that. Otherwise public access would go away. And sadly that's happening across the country 
Um, <clears throat> many cities no longer have a public access, separate public access TV station. In fact, most now in Colorado, we're the last one. There is, I believe, actually, I believe Aspen. Is that right, Sergio? I think uh, Eagle Valley. There, separate. Eagle Valley. So there's there's one other public access TV uh, network in Colorado that's separate from the city. Every other city has taken that and they've taken that function into the city, all of the educational and the government programming, and they will sometimes have, you know, one guy who works part time doing public access in one of their studios, like Fort Collins does that. Um, and really, public access has kind of just disappeared. Denver shut theirs down last year, so. Um, and they just took it in. They have one part-time person running that stuff now. So, so you're seeing uh, so for a, a piece of local media kind of disappear. Yeah. Uh, so, so I will put my city council hat back on. I'll, I'll, the disclaimer here is that I do this as a volunteer, as, as you all know. Yes. Uh, but every once in a while, probably in every one of these at some point in time, there, there, there is a reason to put a city council hat back on. I, I will say this, uh, having gone through that budgeting cycle, uh, and when we when we got to the topic of, of public access television and we we saw the pattern of declining resources, it, it has to beg the question, and it did, what are we going to do differently going forward? Uh, if, we're, if we have fewer resources and greater needs, right, or at least less cash flow and greater needs, what are we going to do differently with the cash flow? And I have to say, uh, the, the part of the story here, part of the backstory is, it's one thing to talk about doing more with less or getting more with less. Uh, that is what's happening here. Uh, the city, in my opinion, both as a volunteer and as a, as a council member, um, I, I look at what's happening and, and I'm thoroughly convinced we're getting more for fewer dollars. And I don't know, you know, you're, you're figuring out how to leverage that and I want you to talk about how you're leveraging those resources in service to the community. But that's part of the story and I wanna add Right now, we're doing, this, we're doing this program today virtually because of the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, it's a powerful part of the story, what you're doing. What I, as I watch Macy, as I watch Sergio uh, apply their talents to serving this community, it's, it's pretty extraordinary what the city is getting for its money way beyond what it was getting. And I don't mean to be disparaging to anybody who provided service in the past, but to do to do same old same old, or just less of same old with as the dollars decline, wasn't the kind of future we wanted to move into, and that's what you brought us. So, talk about you talked about the recording of the of the meetings. Talk more about what are we getting? What is the city getting for its money, and how are you leveraging those resources so that you're growing services even as the city's resources are declining? Macy, you want to pick that up? Well, in, in response of COVID-19, uh, we were working under certain uh, restrictions. Uh, the, the contract we work under outlines that we give the city 20 uh, hours a week, and then we record the, the boards and commissions and a few other things on top of that. But with COVID-19, we saw this huge need that the city needed to reach more people. And we have multiple avenues of being able to do that and reaching people at all different levels of income and socioeconomics and, and all kinds of different ways. And so uh, we had a, a quick meeting and we said, how do we reorganize what we're doing um, so that we can make sure that we're available to the city for whatever their needs are? Um, so that we are also supporting our internal videographers and editors and things like that um, through COVID-19. And so we basically opened up the doors and said to, uh, to the city of Walmart, um, please, whatever you need, let us know. If that's sitting there with a daily show, uh, daily updates, if that's doing public service announcements, if that, I mean, how do, you, how do you want us to do that? And kind of just stopped and we're like, I don't know, help us out. And so we did have a uh, member meeting where our membership said, hey, this is what I'd like to see. And here's what I've heard my neighbors say they want to hear from the city. And so we have a list of probably about 50 show ideas to work from. And I have been working with city staff members very closely. Um, 
they come to me with an idea and they say, okay, this is kind of where we want to go with this. And I, I can say, because I've listened to our community and I've been so connected there that I can say, this is what your community wants. How do we merge that? And so those videos, those PSAs are um, not just a, a message from the city, but they're aimed so that the community un, um, gets that message better. And it's, it's basically uh, digested for the, or easier, I guess. Um, but then there's other, other things that we're working on. I know um, Sergio and I just talked yesterday about doing something for the business community. And, um, you know, how do we, we bring resources there? Um, one of the other things that we've oh, kind of- that? What was that thing for the business community? Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Oh, okay. Um, well, it, it, we, we just simply started talking about ta um, forming some, some concept of a show around the business community leaders, LEDP, LDDA, the chamber, the Latino chamber, um, members of the city staff. I know Sergio does a lot with uh, Innovate Longmont and just bringing that together and saying, hey Longmont, this is how, um, what's available to you. Here's your resources. Here are the creative ideas that have come up just in our community and here's how we can band together and support our economic system here in Longmont. Um, so we're still in the idea phase of that, and I know Sergio's got some great ideas to help support that show. Um, one of the other things we did for the city itself was um, some of their of the staff there, especially the recreation staff, started recording exercise videos, and uh, the museum is doing like art for kids, things you can do at home. The, they're also doing like their typical Thursday night programming, but virtually. And so all of this virtual stuff has really come together and we've been a platform for them to be able to broadcast that out. And so we daily, uh, twice a day, actually uh, 8 and 3 p.m. have exercise shows so people can tune in and get some little exercise while they're staying at home and staying away from others. Um, Wow, there's like the 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 ways that we've been able to help has been amazing, and um, it's been great working with um, all the communication staff at the city, and even beyond just some of the, uh, you know, the staff in like the recreation center or the senior center. Or arts and public places had great ideas too. So it's been really fun just being able to figure out how do we survive COVID nineteen together and and follow the protocols, but um, still stay connected. So the three words that come to mind as I listen to you are nimble, responsive, and service, right? Yes. Uh, which wouldn't be a bad way to be known, right, as yeah. an entity, a service entity. Sergio, talk a little bit more, drill down a little bit more about uh, the interest in the business community. What should, what, it, it, let's assume we have some, since everybody's home now, doing, you know, trying to find something to watch, maybe we'll have some of our business leaders, uh, leaders in our business community watch this. Uh, what would you like them to know? about what you're prepared to do and, and how to get it done. Sure, so um, I would primarily say that we have the distribution and that's primarily what we've been working on is making it um, easier to distribute content across our community, across mobile phones, online, television, um, so forth and so on. Just making it easier for them to send us content, us distribute it and have people watch it. Um, that's something we've been striving for and we've been actively working on with some other cool and exciting things that are coming up. Um, so that, I guess that's really what I wanted to highlight there. Very good. So yeah. I, I know going into this, um, uh, leveraging resources, uh, building a sustainable business model, uh, and doing that in a way that in some ways reflects what you learned at the Tinker Mill and then what you've brought forward and what you've learned since the Tinker Mill. So talk about that. Talk about the leverage, how you're leveraging. Talk about what it means to be a member. What are members, what's the, what's the value of being a member of Longmont Public Media in the makerspace? People with particular interests, background, or things they'd like to learn. What does LPM represent for them? Well, you see a bunch of different things happening. We have folks come in that are, um, pretty much novices but want to learn how to do certain things. Uh, we have a bunch of people who are experts in certain areas, like we've got 
uh, several sound people that are sound engineers and know how to run recording studios. We've got folks that have been doing video for many years, and know how to do editing. Um, we've got fo folks who are professionals who are doing this now, just starting out in their 20s, uh, trying to build a business around creating videos, but also wanting to give back to the community and to teach others how to do stuff. Um, and what we have there is a 5,000 square foot facility, which is the old Carnegie building at 457 4th Avenue in Lomont. And uh, we have in there um, one, two, we have a, one large television studio, which is uh, very, you know, quite, it's really a, probably the biggest black box type studio in Longmont. Uh, could be used for all kinds of things, for events, um, for other entities to be able to use. Um, to have, it, have their own events in and have their own shows if they, if they wanted to do that. Uh, and then we have smaller studios. We have uh, podcasting studios. We have small green screen studios. We even have a small recording studio in the basement with voice booths. Um, so there's a bunch of, of, of space that's usable for lots of things there. Uh, and what that does is that then allows us to put equipment in those spaces. And the kind of equipment we're using um, right now is we don't really go out and buy seven or $8,000 cameras, we use iPhones and we use Nevo cameras, which are these small um, multi-view cameras that act like television studios effectively. Um, and we will be using some higher end cameras as we start to develop more of a, a revenue model that allows us to buy some of that stuff. But we're doing pretty well without a lot of it already. So, so that kind of creates the place um, where people can come. Then what we do is we have, we're open to the public. Anybody can come anytime they want. Um, right now, obviously they can't because everything's shut down. Yeah. Uh, but um, generally the building is open to the public during regular business hours. Uh, and that's free and access to everything is free, uh, including things like our editing bays. We have super high-end computers um, that are really good for video editing. Usually requires, you know, very expensive hardware to do that. Plus we have all the software um, that uh, you'd like Premiere and Final Cut Pro and all the ones that the professionals use to create movies with right down to your home, cutting up your own home videos so you can do everything in between. Uh, and if you become a member, like Tinkermill, we have four levels of membership, um, which is um, the, uh, <laughs> um, the low end membership, which is $25 a month, which is for like students and starving media makers. Um, $50 a month, members, $75 a month for a family of up to five, and we don't define what a family is. That could be five guys sharing a house. We don't really care. And then $100 a month for corporations or companies, entities that want to come in and use the space um, uh, for creating their own stuff. Um, and they can have up to five seats as well. And it's operated as a 501c3. We're a nonprofit charity. So um, and everybody there can teach each other. Plus, we also have classes on all the different types of equipment that we have, as well as we're going to start classes here soon on how to how to actually be good at this, how to shoot video well, um, how do you light things, you know, how do you how do you make it so that a product looks really good. So being able to do that. Um, uh, and being a member uh, gives you access to all of that and being able to reserve it. So if you're a member, you can reserve a studio, you can reserve equipment. You also have access to the space 24 seven. So you'll get access um, to a lockbox, <clears throat> And we're in the process now of figuring out how to do uh, access to the building with an app on your phone, but that'll take a little while. But once you're a member, you have access, you have basically have, have free access to the building. Um, so, and it's worked really, really well at Tinker Mill. So we're pretty sure that it'll work pretty well here. The only problem we really have right now is that we had a, a ramp up of members that we were hoping to uh, create this year from a revenue perspective and COVID has really, hasn't even flattened that curve. It's kind of dropped that curve. Yeah. Um, and that, that is probably our biggest challenge right now is how do we replace the potential revenue drops or the, well, the projected revenue drops from the city uh, contract we have with membership. Uh, now I don't know if that's gonna happen this year like we had hoped. That's our, probably our biggest fear right now. Yeah, well, uh, you and the whole rest of the world, huh? we're all trying to we're all the same boat. recalibrate uh, what our expectations should be and what's possible going forward. Yeah. Um, 
maybe the upside of that is we uh, we have a whole new ways to think about what sustainability looks like and you know how we contribute. And like what uh, we're doing right here. Of this. Yep. Like what we're doing right here. This is a good example of something. I mean, we're making a TV show. All of us sitting in our respective. Um, I'm sitting in a fake. This is not real. <laughs> I could tell. I could tell you're not sitting at Long Tucky, <laughs> which I think is the background there. For it's you. just software making the background look like something other than it is. Yeah. And we're not very good at this yet. We're still figuring out. But this is a good example. For instance, yeah. we talked a little bit about this. We want to be able to do this show using diff using a background that is taken a picture of from a different angle. Yeah. So it looks like we're all in the same place when we switch between stuff. And it'll be a very professional production. Now, it'll take us a while to figure that out. But that's the kind of stuff, the kind of innovation that we're really trying to push forward here. All right. Macy, if somebody... Uh, somebody walks in and says, look, I'm a neophyte. I have an interest. Uh, what's the, how do I get started? Where, where would you point them uh, to, to start building a learning curve, developing a skill set? Is it on content? It is on the technical aspects. How does somebody get started to become more productive if they're interested in, in media like this? Well, just prior to the COVID-19, um, you know, up at our pandemic, uh, Sergio and I had kind of created um, kind of a workflow for that, actually. So uh, we offer tours to our facility and get everybody kind of acclimated with what is already there and what potential could be and inviting them right there on the spot to start dreaming about what that could be from their perspective. Um, is that creating a, a a movie in our big studio or is that the back end of that and operating our control room or taking them down to the music recording studio and letting them dream about the music they're going to create down there and so that i think is is the start um just getting people in there just starting to dream about it and following that opportunity or th that tour we give everybody an opportunity to walk away or sign up right then and there. Um, if you wanna sign up and become a member right there, orientation is immediately available to them so that they can immediately get their code um, to the door and begin to start creating on their own time. We suggest the different classes that are available and we connect them. Uh, we use Slack as our internal communication and so we connect them in Slack right away. And if they have any questions about, oh, um, maybe they're very interested in audio production. Uh, so then I immediately will connect them with the, the members who have said, hey, I'm audio people. I'll connect them so that they can start talking and asking questions and doing some one-on-one. -on -one. Or we connect them with those classes that have already been established so that they can learn how to use the equipment um, that they want to use. Um, many times those people come in and they're like, oh, I already know how to use these things. Let me show you. And so we just, we'll sit down with you right then and there and, and go through something you want to talk about or, um, you know, set up a camera and start playing. But that, that's kind of the fun part of my job in our, our everyday, at least. This is the part I kind of enjoy more than anything is having somebody come in and say, hey, guess what? I'm setting up a camera in here. Do you want to come play with the green screen with me? I just want to test something. Yeah. And, and we also, but we also um, have a distribution mechanism, right? Yes. I mean, we distribute, we have channel eight, you know, we have channel 880. So if you create a show, we have a place where we can put it out onto the entire, to the entire city um, that has Comcast. And also you can watch everything on our website live uh, anytime. All you have to do is and so there's a constant, there's a TV station for Longmont yeah. uh, that Macy runs. She is the, um, effectively the executive producer of the TV. And she decides what goes up and uh, she programs that whole thing herself. Well, so to, to share with, I'm sorry, Sergio, were you going to Oh, yeah, in? just real quick. I just wanted to chime in. So um, one of the things that I think we learned, and well, maybe not learned, but we verified that we guessed was true was through the observer um, we focus primarily only on Longmont specific content. Um, we didn't do anything Boulder, nothing, you know, outside of Longmont. Um, and we saw and verified that people crave local content. So with Longmont Public Media, 
um, as an extension of the observer, you know, people crave local, locally produced content and they want to consume it locally as well or anywhere really, but they, there is no other mechanism to host nor create, you know, that local content. So Sergio, as long as you have the, the floor talk, I, I heard reference earlier to, uh, uh, Macy mentioned a membership meeting. Yep. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, when do members get together? And, and now how would they get together given uh, the social distancing we're doing? Sure. Yeah. So before the pandemic, we we're meeting every Thursday from 7 to 8 p.m. at the Longmont Public Media Building, uh, 457 4th Street in Longmont. Um, we've since transitioned to do it online on, on Zoom. Uh, we actually tried a variety of different platforms from Google Meet to WebEx to Zoom. Uh, we we're trying some self-hosted ones earlier as well. Um, so it's all digital, it's all online, same time frame. Um, we put that information out on the website so anyone can join um, and, and just find out what we're about and you know, go from there. When are, so, those, when are those meetings? Yeah. That's, when are they? <laughs> yeah, when are those meetings? <laughs> oh, they are every Thursday from 7 to 8 p.m. online. Okay. I, just, um, I would just like to add on to those meetings. It's a great place for um, our members and anyone in the community to kind of come together and work on different projects. I think that's been the biggest success of those meetings is, is collaboration. Well, as a, as a member myself and having attended in person and now having attended at least one virtual meeting, uh, it's, for, it's a chance for my path to cross the paths of folks who I would not have otherwise had a chance to meet who are, unbelievably talented, highly motivated, a lot of fun. So uh, if nothing else, it would be a chance for people, even if you're not interested in the media, to make new friends who are very much involved in the community and paying attention to what's going on. So um, Scott, you mentioned Channel 8. You've had a, you, there are, you've, you've gone through this, it's been a fast paced transition, right? From uh, moving from 2019 and 2020 and almost immediately then confronted with the complications of social distancing and, and having to pivot, right, be nimble and responsive as Amish described earlier. You've learned a lot about that distribution system on Channel 8. Share with us some of what you've learned and, um, and, and how you intend to capitalize on that distribution system going forward. Well, what we, a, a bunch of things happened really rapidly. Um, as you know, uh, the city council chamber shut down um, yeah. primarily for um, they were their uh, uh, remodeling. Yeah. yeah, remodeling, but it's really more than that. It's making it more accessible for yeah. handicapped and a bunch of really good things actually. So, so, but this was not something that we had actually been told about <laughs> when we were bidding for the contract. So, what happened was we had to figure out how to do remote um, public access. Uh, city council meetings on a fairly large scale and we're pretty good at, at covering meetings remotely and doing this stuff um, but doing it where we were we were responsible for all of the aspects of it from audio to um, to AV to being able to live stream it to being able to get it up on channel 8 from a remote location it wasn't set up for it still isn't set up for it. so effectively every week we have to set up a tell we had to set up a television studio from scratch in about 30 minutes so that you could have your meeting for anywhere from two to four hours and then we had to shut down in about 30 minutes. So it was an interesting experience and it also taught us a lot about how, um, you know, this is definitely doable and it's doable with reasonably, reasonably priced technology. We didn't have to go out and buy, you know, a huge TV truck and $150,000, $200,000 worth of equipment, which is what Channel 9 does. For instance, they show up with a truck with literally hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment and a staff of six people to run a production. So what we figured out to, how, to, how to do, and Sergio gets huge credit for this, um, how do we use existing um, technology, software, and low cost gear to set up a multi-camera studio? Uh, and, and I'll let him actually talk about what, what we're doing there now. So Sergio, why don't you just jump in and talk a little bit about what we're doing and how we're able to use that. Sure. I mean, yeah, we have a variety of different setups, but um, we have uh, something called Squeaker Studio, where we use a variety of different iPhones um, to create a multi-cam setup. Um, you just need the software for it. 
um, which makes you know setting up uh, recordings or live streams incredibly easy. Um, we have different Mevo setups, um, looking at getting additional um, other cameras uh, to make these setups even easier. Um, so it's a combination of software and hardware that um, is available now for cheap that makes you know kind of modernizing public access uh, easier. So. It also allows us to do things like cover these 17 boards of commissions, which yeah. Macy, uh, she pretty, she does a bunch of them herself, but she also coordinates volunteers to show up at these and has, and actually you've spent a fair amount of time getting people who are on these boards and commissions to, to run the cameras, right? Why don't you talk a little about what you do there? Yeah, our, um, our hardware, the cameras that we use are so easy to use and easy to train anybody on. And essentially for boards and commissions, uh, the idea is to get the, the business of the meeting and not necessarily focus on the individual board members. Um, so it's easy to set up a camera in the corner of the room and hit or hit record and, and uh, I know several several of the board members have actually participated in doing that and then all of our volunteers um, who have done that have, have received some training on that and continue to get some training as we learn some bugs in that system but um, but it's been so simple for just you know college students or average Joe people who have no you know major media experience to go in and help us with some of this those little recordings. So once we do that, um, we also then have a process, and why don't you talk a little bit about this, where we take the video and we use software to create a transcription. How does that work? Yeah, so we use otter.ai and we um, upload it to that system and it will take all of the audio from that recording and create a transcription that can be used in a multitude of ways. Uh, one of the ways is the secretaries of those meetings have referred back to that. Um, whenever they they missed something that, that they were just, it was just going too fast for them to actually record and they, they missed an important word or something. Um, it's also been good for the public to be able to look at those and read that. So not only reaching to people who um, have difficulties with hearing, um, they now get to read what's happening with our city governments. Um, and you know, it's just it's been it's been a great tool for us also just to to pair it with that video, um, and, and be able to reference it for ourselves and for other media organizations have used this it. The, this is the first time that um, I think there's ever been full text transcripts of anything uh, for from the city council or boards and commissions. I got a call from a reporter from the Times call uh, three days ago saying, thank you for these videos that you're doing of the city council because what, I can't be there. And um, without those videos, we couldn't be doing the reporting we're doing on council right now. So, so we are, um, even though we do have the Loman Observer, we also are supporting uh, other media organizations, both profit and nonprofit in the community. I will tell you, as a as a liaison to some of those boards and commissions, and as a as a member of the council, uh, both the videos and the transcripts become uh, save a lot of time. Uh, it is not unusual to want to go back months, you know, when a, an issue gets started eight months ago, and now you're you know going to vote on something, and to go back and try to track the discourse that's occurred. Um, is a challenge to be able to now go back and look at transcripts without having to go through tapes and uh, is a huge service. So thank you for that. You can search the transcripts. That's yes, you can. So, so um, what else, what are the, here's my last question. And that is, what else do you want people to know? Uh, what, extend the invitation to get involved. Uh, what have we missed uh, in this conversation that is, that you think critical for whether they're policymakers, uh, members, or just member, uh, just members of the public. Well, I w I, let me say this, and I would like each of you to also say whatever you think here. But most important, www.longmontpublicmedia.org. Longmontpublicmedia.org. Please go there um, uh, and uh, take a look at what's there. Uh, you can become a member. You don't have to pay, pay to become a member. You can just become a public member there. Um, we'll put you on a mailing list to tell you things that are going on. 
uh, but join, join Longmont Public Media, even as just a non-paying public member is totally, we'd love to have you. Um, so that's probably the most important thing. Get involved. Come and All get right. involved and feel free to come down to the building when we open again, hopefully in the next couple of months. Jason, and, you're going to have the last word on this. So Sergio? I would say, obviously, similar to Scott, you know, visit LomaPolvia.org. Um, but I think one of the beautiful things about LPM is that it's limited really by your own creativity. Um, there's so many possibilities of what people can create from possible dating shows on a local level to Shark Tank and, you know, all kinds of different things. Uh, technology wise, you know, technology wise, how do we, you know, maybe develop a platform that's easier for city council meetings to be broadcast and public invited to be heard? Um, or there's just a lot of opportunity um, to play around, experiment with new technology, create content, uh, and distribute that content. So if you're, you know, interested in all that, and, you know, we'd love to have you, please, please come. There's never been a more important time for it than right now. Macy, you have the last word. Yeah, I think um, on top of, of what Sergio was saying, you know, it's, it's limited by your creativity, but especially during our COVID-19, right now, I know a lot of businesses are trying to reach out to the community and stay present, stay um, out in front with people watching them. And so we've opened up all of our services just for the yoga studio to, you know, show off a yoga class or, um, you know, a restaurant wants to show us how they make their signature dish and they want to record that. Um, or, you know, a, a band who wants to virtually play and share that with Longmont. Like we have, we've just been trying to invite people to let us help you be in front of Longmont and we use all the platforms available to us to, to advertise that. So not only do we broadcast that on channel eight and YouTube and um, on our own website, but we also use the Longmont Observer to help promote some of that to say, hey, look at these people, go here and, and see what they have to offer. Because we, we first, I think and foremost, just want to be community members and, and to be there for Longmont and whatever their needs are. All right, thanks to the three of you for, for participating in this. More importantly, thanks for the service that you're rendering to the city of Longmont and our residents. And Longmont residents, that is the backstory on public access television and Longmont public media.